We all have stories sunken deep into our bones. Some rest on the surface, our skin becomes soil for the graveyard of unspoken tragedies. As a butcher, my hands have touched upon death more times than perhaps the devil himself. But it's my eyes that suffered the most when they laid upon the figure of my father gently swaying. My name is Michel, and this is my story. Before the age of 10, I was a simple child. I had my family, and together we lived in a small town in Normandy. We were neither rich nor poor, yet we were abundant in the things that mattered, such as love. I had two sisters and a brother. I was not particularly close with my siblings, but none of that mattered because I had my parents. Until the day that I didn't. Nine years old, young eyes dancing upon death, the face of a father gazing soullessly down to his son. Ten years old, two sisters too young to understand, a brother who took everything and left my mother who had nothing but the skin on her bones, and me, a forgotten son. After the day I found him, there never had been the time to properly grieve for my father. Money was sparse and had to be made, and with my older brother taking what little we had left and leaving with his wife, I was the only man left. I was ten years old and had to assume the responsibilities my father had left the day he decided to die. Grief continued to eat away at my mother's soul until she too was just bones buried beneath skin. When I was 12, she sent me away to a boys' camp in hopes that another family would adopt me. I never did get adopted though, and from that point on, I considered myself an orphan. You see, nothing in life ever comes in just one. Tragedies often follow in packs, and I was the lamb they liked to taunt as they chased. Never fast enough to fully ensnare me, but always just seconds behind nipping at my heels, waiting for the moment when I would tire, or slip and lose my footing right into their greedy hands. With no one left to turn to, I trusted the first man that would look at me. He was the devil, disguised under thousands of scars littered across his fingers and that permanent frown upon his face. Yet, I sold my soul to him, as easily as one would give a platter of meat away. 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. Those were the hours I had to work, in exchange to be housed and fed. I soon learned after my first day working for him that his version of housing meant sleeping outside with his dogs, and being fed meant scraps of leftover meat and bread. One day, the man had called my name from a distance. I followed his voice into the yield to find him standing with a knife in his left hand and a pig to his right. I quickly realised he wanted me to slaughter the pig. I was twelve and pleaded with him not to make me do it. Death always made me think of my father. However, he showed me no sympathy, digging his fists deep into my stomach as he made it clear that it was either the animal or me. A year and a half passed by. My brother had his first child. I'd heard it from a customer who came in one day to buy three pounds of bison. I'd been in the bag, hidden from the customers as I almost always was. But for the first time, I was thankful because no one but the cows that hung from the ceiling could see the one tear that wetted the wooden chopping board. My mother never called, not for my birthday nor the anniversary of my father's death. But I still sent her half my paycheck every month. It wasn't much, but I doubt she would have called to say thank you, even if it had been. It wasn't until I met a little German boy named Warner that I'd felt close to someone again. Warner was my age. He was from Munich, but lived in Paris with his family while they conducted business. He was only in Normandy for a week. During that week, he often came by the butcher's shop, sneaking around the back while I would slaughter animals. Not once did he ever mention how cruel of a job it seemed. Instead, he just kept me company, speaking to me as if I was a friend he hadn't seen in a while. 
When the end of the week had approached, Warner had come to the shop and offered for me to come back to Paris with him. He had seen the marks my boss left scattered across my face and told me he was sure I could find a better place to work in the city. I'd grown accustomed to my life over the years, as horrible as it might sound, so I didn't care much to leave and start a new job. However, it had been so long since I had someone in my life that acknowledged me, that I decided to leave for Paris with him anyways. The butcher hadn't been the best boss, but he'd been a damn good butcher, and I'd learnt enough over the past years that I was confident I'd be able to find work. So in Paris I stood. There was something about big cities that made it easy to forget. Written into my seams was still the orphan who took comfort within the streets. But here I was in a city that bustled and barreled with busy lives, with a new brother and a new family. Money was scarce, but happiness started to flow like the ripples of the current throughout La Seine. Warner's family took me in and treated me as their own. Years went by, and like every French male, when I turned 18, I had to join the army. On my first night back home, the fellow recruits and I had gone down to the hotel's bar for a beer. It was there that I met the woman I knew I was going to marry. She was blonde and delicate, the complete opposite of a brute butcher. But one glance at her, and suddenly I knew she was going to be my redemption. I was even more convinced it was fate when I found out we shared the same name, Michelle. I nicknamed her Mimi, and she almost poured my beer over my head. She was striking in that sense. Dear Mimi, I have no education, nor brimming money to provide, or a family for you to meet. I am not the man you probably envision to love one day, but to me, you are everything and more. When holding you, the death that always seemed to linger between the lines of my hands starts to fade away. I've never had anything to lose, but with you, suddenly I have everything. Meet me in Paris so we can start our own business and eventually our own family. With everything in me, Michel. So that's what we decided to do. Once again, I was working from 5am to 8pm, but this time I had Mimi alongside me. It was hard, but working hard was all I'd ever known. By 24, Mimi and I had two beautiful daughters and a business that was steady. We lived cramped upstairs in the shop and continued to work long hours, but it was worth it when the papers redeemed us the best butchers in Normandy. From there, we decided to open up a second establishment. This brought in even more success, and we were finally able to move out from the shop and into a home we had built from scratch. The house was two stories and was bigger than anything I'd ever lived in before. Yet, I continued to work the same hours I had when I was a little boy sleeping with the dogs. It had become ingrained in me, and for that I was grateful, for it had brought me the life I now lived. Many years went by. Whilst working in the shop, I would often find myself thinking about Warner. It had been so long since I'd heard from him or his family. I decided to visit Germany in hopes of finding him. To my surprise, he had passed away whilst travelling to France to see me. This news broke me. It made me think about my father and how I never got to say goodbye. Warner may have died but I made sure his memory lived on within my family. As for my mother, she finally reached out to me when I was in my 40s, but I ignored her. I continued to send her money and make sure she was well fed until the day she died. At 10, I had nothing, a fatherless child yielding to the streets. At 12, I had to learn discipline, hands hardened by a heavy mind. At 18, I found love, affection through ink from the letters I did send. At 24, I found meaning. Two daughters who ran loops around the shop I could call my own. And now at 45, I hold my first grandson in between my scabrous arms as a silent tear drips down my plumped cheek. For my daughter has just told me 
she's named him Warner.